So hi, everyone. Thanks for coming. Uh, the title of this session is Hypertext, Following the Bank Links of History. So basically, the purpose of this session is to do a little bit of time travel and uh, like remember where Hypertext comes from. And uh, after we're done with like remembering this history, then ask ourselves, what the future of hypertext looks like. So uh, many of you probably have heard about um, this year's uh, hype around backlinks. And a few applications have been uh, adding this functionality to help us better organize information and manage our knowledge. But backlinks are not new at all. If you guys remember uh, before Google, or actually this name, um, their project was called Backrub. So they had this mission to organize the world's information. Um, but that, that came after they realized that um, most of the value in the information around the web came from the links between web pages. And the web had a flaw. It didn't have the directional links. So the guys that founded Google started with this premise. And then they asked themselves, uh, what if they could download the whole web and just keep the links, right? And then uh, at the time, they thought that the web was representing human knowledge. So those links between web pages would work as an indicator of the relationships between different pieces of knowledge. So that was like, that's the most recent um, appearance of backlinks, but definitely not the first one. And around this notion of organizing information, there's another example that happened about 100 years ago or a little bit more. And Google actually organized a talk to honor this legacy of a person called Paul Audley. So his philosophy was around um, this like, premise. Giving better access to information might help prevent future wars. So he was all working around this. Uh, how to find better methods for organizing the world's recorded knowledge. And he wanted to build an archive of all human knowledge that, that would be freely available. So you can definitely find the parallels between his vision and uh, what ultimately Backrub and then Google uh, set out to accomplish. And part of their work that they did in what they called the Mandanem was to create a symbolic language to encode relationships from one topic to another. Paul Audley passed away in 1944. And one year later, um, Vannevar Bush published this famous article called As We May Think. His basic philosophy was that the key lied in selection by association rather than indexing. So he was concerned with the problem of getting at the record. We would say this data or document today, but he was just like thinking about how to better reach whatever we stored before. And he was concerned about the artificial systems of indexing. And you would think that uh, we would have solved that problem by now, but even search engines are using this notion of indexing instead of what Benever Bush was advocating for uh, so many years ago which was um, indexing by association in analogy to the way that the brain works. So he believed that the essential feature of such a system for managing knowledge was the ability to tie items together to form trails. And we're going to see that uh, throughout this conversation. This notion of trails is going to pop up from different uh, points of view. This is how the mimics looked like. And at the time, of course, there were no digital computers. So what he set out to do was um, envision a machine that would use a technology called microfilm to store all the documents and the connections between them. Another person that was really influential in the development of interactive computing and the internet was uh, Lick Leiter. His vision was around human-computer symbiosis. 
and he was focused on hemp helping humans and computers work together. He believed that computers were more of an expressive medium, and he didn't believe that hype about AI. This happened like 50 years ago, and uh, at the time, people believed that AI uh, was like 20 or 30 years away, and uh, it seems to be the case still now. So I mentioned this thing about AI because this acronym, in my opinion, also holds for what Doug Engelbart called augmenting human intellect. So, of course, uh, he was very influential in the development of computers. The most impressive demonstration was the mother of all demos like the mouse and video conference and text editing and collaboration, many things that we would expect to have by now. But as you will see, uh, part of their visions are still not uh, fulfilled. So he was working on around knowledge augmentation. And uh, of course, he was influenced by the saw of an uh, mimics. But he noticed 20 years later that the concept of a memex could be implemented by replacing the microfilm with modern computers. And that's what he set out to do with uh, his lab and projects. So if the goal was to have a device that could put the entirety of human knowledge at your fingertips, linked and cross-linked into an ever-expanding web of associations, this is what we now call hypertext. This word was coined by Ted Nelson. His philosophy was around this uh, notion of breaking free from linear thought and hierarchical power structures. His most famous project was the Sanadu project. And uh, he influenced many of us working in hypertext with many of the notions of nonlinear format, non-sequential text, and uh, the topic of this talk, uh, backlinks, which are pieces of links that link back to the source. Of course, he had some other uh, opinions about the purpose of backlinks in terms of intellectual property and monetization, but that's not core to our conversation because uh, what really matters about backlinks is that they help you navigate between different pieces of knowledge. So Aslan published this tweet a few months ago, implementing this uh, notion from Ted Nelson called parallel pages, visibly connected. And uh, this triggered an entire conversation about the relationship between hypertext and graphical user interfaces. And the closest connection back in time is uh, hypercard. So back at Apple, Bill Atkinson developed this concept of user interfaces that you could navigate through by clicking through links. And then they called it HyperCard. This is just one of the screenshots explaining that the navigation in that time uh, quoted would happen between cards by following links. And this is the closest connection between hypertext and user interfaces. And when we talk about the future of hypertext, uh, this is one of the things that we could go back and analyze. Like how can hypertext help us build better user interfaces for the future? Another person related to the user interface was Alan Kay. Back at Xerox Spark, they developed this concept. And then uh, it's widely known that Apple and then Microsoft were influenced by what was developed at Xerox Spark. But I mentioned Alan Kay here not in the context of user interfaces alone, but in the context of his complaints about the design of the web and the computer revolution. So the most relevant quote here is the web was designed by amateurs. And it's a little bit uh, rough. But what he meant, I think, was not really the web itself, but the way we browse the web. So he was criticizing the browsers. And in some of his talks about object-oriented programming, he even makes references to the way he believes the web should work by exchanging standalone pieces of software or objects without having to hard code the formats and the protocols to exchange them. 
So the notion would be like, you want the web or the browser to be a mini operating system and not really an application. And this is what we have now. So certainly this is something to remember when thinking about the future of hypertext and interfaces on the web. He also complained about HTML. And uh, finally, he gives us hope. Even though this talk was given in 1997, I think it's still relevant and probably true that the computer revolution hasn't happened yet because of the things that we will uh, check up next. So of course, now we're talking about the shortcomings of the web and hypertext in general. So the creator of the web, uh, Tim Berners-Lee, um, was complaining about some of the decisions that happened in the 90s coming from the browsers, for example. And one of the things was that they didn't put editing tools in the browser. So the, the web was thought, conceived as a collaborative medium, something to help people build stuff together, which is actually the theme of this hackathon, how to make and understand things together. And then um, the other problem noticed by the author of Catalog in the World, the first book that we reviewed here, is that we are still tied to the paper-based metaphor. So when thinking about future user interfaces, this is something to uh, keep in mind as well. So there's, there's this blog post that I really like, uh, published a couple years ago by John Ono. And one of the sentences in the blog post is, the web will not be the last hypertext system. I really like this statement because before that, I was just assuming, like most of us, that yeah, the web's pretty much done. We just have to make incremental improvements. And I didn't even think about the web as one of the instances of a larger category of hypertext systems, of which the web is merely the most popular. And after I read that blog post, I was like, OK, what's the future of the web? And if the web doesn't implement some of the features in the vision of these people, um, maybe some other system will implement it either on top of the web or as a separate technology. So of course, um, we owe the web to the work of many people around the 1990s, of which Tim Berners-Lee is the most recognized because of the creation of the protocol, the language for markup, and the first web browser. But it's interesting to note that even himself had lots of um, different ideas and a different vision for the web than that one we ended up with. So the earlier motivation for the web was actually to help him remember the connections among people, computers, and projects at CERN. And he wanted to create a space in which anything could be linked to anything else. So if you think about the web today, it's made of web pages, and you can only link between web pages. So this anything part of the vision has not been accomplished yet. And finally, I mean, he states directly in his book, Weaving the Web, the vision I have for the web is about anything being potentially connected with anything. So hopefully in the conversation about the future of hypertext, we can also keep this into account and figure out a way to explore um, technologies that would let us connect anything and not just web pages. So going back to Vannevar Bush's memics in this book, The Dream Machine, which is mostly about Lake Lighter, but in general, the revolution that led to the creation of the internet, this quote says, Bush never explained where this notion of associative trails had come from. Today, we know it as hypertext. And that vast hyperlink web of knowledge is called the World Wide Web. It's a nice quote, but I happen to disagree personally because the web of knowledge, of human knowledge, is not fully represented by the World Wide Web. And even if it was, we are still missing the original notion of associative trails that would let us recommend paths of associations and share them with our friends so that they can find or discover the same resources that we found without having to go 
to a search engine necessarily. So I mentioned this book in a previous call. It's my favorite book of the year because it makes this uh, description of the parallels between trails in nature and trails in human life. So the author, Robert Moore, notices that trails are a great way of externalizing and organizing information, and it can be found used in organisms as simple as slime molds and ants and everything. The parallel here is from this book, these two quotes, the memex would not on its own solve the problem of information overload, which is even worse than at the time where Paul Audley was trying to uh, catalog the world's information. And to remedy this problem, Bush envisioned that the text could be strung together into associative trails. So we come back to this notion again, and that's why I mentioned this book. So the core of this small recap of the history of hypertext and this quote that the web will not be the last hypertext system is that the web is not finished yet. And hopefully this will serve as a call to action as it was in my case so that we go and keep building the web. So thanks for listening. and. Uh, Hopefully we can have now a conversation about the future of hypertext and what should we build next. Ideas or questions, anyone? I thought that was really fascinating. Thank you so much for walking us through that. Um, I'm really curious to learn more about what you mean about a hypertext system that sits on top of the web. Could you speak more to that? Sure. So maybe you've had the chance to explain what the difference between the internet and the web is. And one of the ways of explaining that is like with the timeline, one belongs or happened in the 1970s and the other one in the 1990s. But another way to explain it is with uh, your question. The web is built on top of the internet. And that's useful because you build layers of protocols that help you forget about the details in lower layers and just build higher level abstractions. The problem with the web is that, I mean, saying that you're going to replace it almost makes no sense because everyone's using the conventions in the languages for representing web pages, the protocols for exchanging those files, and uh, it's built on top of the internet. So I wouldn't just say, let's build a different hypertext system. Instead, you could imagine how can you make better URLs? So URLs, even though this hypertext system, uh, hypertext notion allows you to break free from hierarchical structures, you are still thinking about slash resource slash soup resource and so on, right? So you're still thinking about hierarchies. So one way that I'm thinking about is um, extending URLs to represent not only hierarchies, but also trails. So you can imagine something like having uh, a sequence of pieces of text that are connected to each other along a trail, and then describe that trail by using slashes instead of some other language. And then you put that in a URL, prefixed by trails maybe, and then you are representing what the Bush had in mind about walking along a trail using a URL without breaking the system, without going back and building some separate stuff. Uh, in terms of language, the HTML language, um, I'm very optimistic ab about that because of things like React. So we are already one step away from writing HTML tags, and we're just like using languages like JSX or Hiccup. And then it's not that difficult to conceive that we can build on top of the web, in this case, on top of HTML, without directly using uh, the original language. And once you do that, then you can imagine the developing languages that are way more powerful than HTML, which is also hierarchical, ironically. 
and then maybe describe some other type of language that allows you to build better user interfaces, even though at the end, it compiles down to HTML. So it would be built in on top of the web, but not being subject to the limitations. Got it. Thank you. No, that's really, really well said. Thank you. Thanks for the question. So I guess there's uh, at least one person uh, that would disagree with this statement that the web is not the last hypertext system. And uh, if that's the case, maybe someone wants to say why uh, that's wrong. I don't know. Uh, I was just wondering, uh, I don't have an answer for your question, but do you have these slides available somewhere else? Because I would really love to analyze it more, like the things you've talked about. Jorge, you're muted. Hello. Oh, yeah, sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I can share the PDF of the slides or the link to the Figma design. Mm -hmm. OK. For sure. Yeah, thanks for the uh, great overview. Um, I was wondering if you had sort of insight, suggestion as far as current projects that you think sort of embody the vision that Kay and others um, had. And like, you know, one thing com that comes to mind is maybe Rome research to some extent, but do you have other things in mind? Yeah, I'm, I'm still in the process of uh, doing that research. There are definitely many projects experimenting with uh, hypertext. I don't have a list of names in hand, but the one you mentioned, for example, Rome and Obsidian, um, it, it's very interesting to notice or to, to analyze the entire revolution that was triggered this year by finding a very elegant way to do backlinks, right? And then you have Notion adding the feature and Obsidian adding the feature. And uh, the question I have is, OK, that's only one type of link. What will happen if we add all the other things in the vision of hypertext that have not been implemented? So yeah, I'm, I'm definitely compiling a list of resources, but I don't have it in hand, so I may forget other names. I'm curious whether um, attempts to annotate the internet fit under your definition. So whether companies like Genius or um, Hypothesis or many of these types of companies would fit your definition. Yeah, I, I actually have a tab open for Hypotheses, but I have not tried it yet. I really like the concept because, and thanks for, for this. I, I forgot about that in the presentation. Um, a couple of weeks ago, I was asking around what the difference between note-taking and annotations was. And uh, because I'm not a nat native English speaker, I uh, didn't have a background for like what's the small difference between them. And I asked some English-speaking friends. And then they said, yeah, marginal annotations. And uh, some of them are in your own words, and some of them are not. So definitely. Um, I'm, I would say I'm even more excited about annotations than note-taking. Because note-taking, I mean, there are many tools, and uh, they will continue to evolve and give you better interfaces and systems and whatever. But annotations is what I really need uh, in the case of reading, for example. So I want to be able to, when I'm reading a book, even if it's just a small mark, that's the way I take annotations right now. Um, just draw a small circle, and I have just this convention of two or three different bullets to say, the next time that I go through the book, physical book, I should stop at that line and read it. So projects like Hypotheses, if they manage to create this next layer of annotations on the web, it would be really helpful because they would, in the process, find a way to break the paper-based metaphor. So right now, we can only point to a, an entire web page. And maybe if you use uh, the anchor tags, 
point to a section. You cannot really point to a specific sentence or word within a paragraph, and that is broken. So we have this like, idea of even from like Ted Nelson's time. Uh, unfortunately, that was like twisted into intellectual property management and uh, micropayments. But the core concept, as in Aslan's implementation of the parallel pages vision, is that you can point to whatever you want, whether it's a blog or not. So in the case of Rome, for example, it's really interesting that they did break away from the page metaphor, but they are still in the block metaphor. You cannot really point to a specific part of the block because you're not building uh, your notes in that way. And that ultimately comes to the question of what is knowledge made of? So definitely it's not made of web pages. And even though it's, a, it's an improvement in the right direction to use blogs like Rome or Notion, knowledge is not made of blogs either. So I think that's something to be solved yet, but definitely on the lines of being able to point or connect two items together, whatever they are, not just pages or blogs. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot of power to annotations. Um, and, you know, Genius, the company that's mainly focused on annotating lyrics right now, that was their in initial ambition. It was to build this annotation layer across the web. They unfortunately didn't succeed in that vision. They're still very much stuck in rap lyrics and music lyrics. Um, you know, studying sort of the, oh. the history of the consumer internet. Yeah, that's the one I mean by Genius. Studying the history of consumer internet, like there have been multiple of attempts to try and build this annotation layer, and all of them have pretty much failed. Um, and I'm curious if anyone has thoughts around why maybe that's the case, because I feel like that's the lowest hanging fruit type solution to a vision towards building kind of a hypertext system on top of the web. What is the lowest thing is fruit? Can you define it more clearly? Oh, sorry. As in like the um, simplest um, solution that I can think of right now, like the, the most incremental solution um, to, to help us kind of get to this vision of a hypertext system that exists on top of the existing web. I think this was mentioned in your slides, but you mentioned Wikipedia as like a failed example for some reason. Uh, I'm not sure. Maybe can you go into that again? Like sure. to me, that's a, that's a great example of of what you're describing. Sure. Uh, by no means, I, I mean to trash on Wikipedia. I love the site. I donate every year, and it's one of my favorite examples of trying to move the web in the right direction. But the problem that they have, and it's not really a design decision, it's just like going with the flow of whatever's out there. And because the web was made of pages, then Wikipedia is made of pages, right? So in that book, it's mentioned in the context of even Wikipedia, which is the most uh, advanced version of collaborative uh, content creation on the web, even they fall in the paper based metaphor. So maybe the context for that is. The original design con conceived the web as a collaborative medium, not as a publishing medium. And the relationship changes a lot because once you take the second path, like publishing, and then you go to the, the history of Mosaic and Netscape, then they didn't have editing tool. And uh, once you make that mistake, or let's say that, that call, then the web becomes this place that you go to consume content. So you have blogging as an attempt to change that problem by providing tools for people without being developers to publish content on the web. And there's this famous um, tagline that inspired blogger, like push button publishing for the people, which I love. But then Wikipedia make another attempt to move the web towards a more collaborative medium by using this technology of letting anyone edit any web page uh, and then like taking care of the different version management stuff. But still, in that sentence, editing web pages is the problem in my opinion. So 
the page comes from the paper-based metaphor and uh, this being a designathon, a design hackathon. Design is mostly based on choosing the right metaphors and affordances. And then the question would be for the future of the web and hypertext in general, what is a better metaphor for organizing information than the page? And that's why I mentioned this book on trails by Robert Moore, because not only I think it's a better metaphor to think in, the t in terms of a process, like I want to go here, 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 I want to recommend this sequence of uh, steps, but also belongs to the original vision of the Neverbush in the Memex. So yeah, by no means uh, I wanted to trash on Wikipedia, I love it. Uh, just to point out that even the best example of using the web as a collaborative medium, not as a publishing medium, is still short in expectations or the original vision of hypertext. Cool, thanks. Yeah, I think like the underlying thing, like Wikidata and Wiki, whatever, sources, is pretty interesting as like an underlying, more traily graph, but I guess the reason why people gravitate to pages, possibly, this is just a hypothesis, is just that like it works for human ergonomic reasons. Um, and trails are hard to understand conceptually, that kind of thing. What do you think of that? Yeah, that's a very good point. Um, you can argue that for simplicity reasons, and if you go back to how networking was at the time and all the limitations of bandwidth, uh, then the easiest way to just think about transferring content was just to say, you have a file, you send it, right? And you didn't even have uh, JavaScript at the time, so you couldn't build the document in the, in the front end. So it would make sense to just think about the page as the unit of knowledge instead of something smaller. Um, I wanted to do something more about the connection between hypertext and the GUI, but uh, unfortunately, it would take a different trail in the conversation, but we can, of course, talk about it now. And that's why I showed HyperCard and Alan K. So one of the things uh, that both K and Nelson mentioned about files is that you don't really need them. So a file is this concept of a sequence and you could say the sequence is also a trail of lines, but I don't want to push it that far. But still, both of them said that you don't need files. Even when you're writing programs, you don't need to store your programs, the source code, in a file. The file comes from an ancient metaphor based on paper and physical filing systems, such as the Mandaneum from Paul Audley, in which you have this piece of paper, and you're not going to assemble the piece of paper every time you want to read it. And that's why you have books as well. You don't want to have the bunch of pages uh, flying around, and then you have having to sort them every time you want to consult them. But with digital systems, you do not have that limitation. So you can think of a, a source file, like this sequence of function definitions and whatever, as a file, text file, and that's how we store it in our code bases. But you can also think about it as being generated on the fly by going through all the pointers, let's say to the individual lines, and then assembling that text, final text, when you need to consume them. If you go to the web, then web pages wouldn't be pages. They would be the result of rendering this, the sequence of pointers that are describing the content of the page, whether that's text, or maybe it's a function that is going to generate the text or something more elaborate. But if you... Um, Think about it. Uh, at the time, that was the only way to do it or the best way to do it. But now we have the technology and the bandwidth and the processing power and everything to stop thinking about pages or uh, software as a collection of files and then go one step further and think about them in terms of pointers to the actual content. Once you do that, in my opinion, that's the way to break free from the paper-based metaphor because then you no longer have to speak about web pages. You have an address to a resource, for example, and then the resource doesn't have a sequence of bytes describing the text, but a sequence of pointers to the bytes describing the text. And once you do this fragmentation, then anyone's able to point to the individual uh, pieces of text 
And then you can do annotations and uh, trails of uh, individual pieces of text instead of pointing to the URL that will give you the entire uh, web page. Yeah, fascinating vision. I think the challenge there is like, you still want to sort of wordsmith things together into a coherent thing in the end. And you sort of lose that ability a bit where you have just like a, you know, like a list of pointers. Like this sort of happens with say a tweet storm where, you know, each tweet is discrete. And let's say you want to like have different breaks. Uh, like you want to have one content go from one place to another. Now, instead of just like changing some text, going backspace, backspace, you have like to manage these different multiple unique, whatever, like little bits in your, in your list, which is already annoying. So anyway, I'm not saying there's no problem. I'm not saying this is not a good direction. I'm just saying that this is an interesting set of unsolved problems, I think. Yeah, that's a good point. And uh, we would have to find the right uh, level of granularity for sure. And it's interesting that you mentioned Twitter, because by starting with the limitation of 140 characters, now double that, uh, and then adding the feature of threats. If you replace the word threats for trails, there you go. That's one possible implementation of the memics metaphor. But yeah, uh, I think there are many other things to experiment with, and uh, we'll see. I don't know if anyone else has a contrast in vision. Thanks, Boris. When you were talking about, uh, like, uh, instead of a file, a reference that points to several other resources, have you read about IPFS? Because they're trying to do something like that. And also, I, w I wanted to add, like, uh, even though we are um, abstracting the concept of a file, and that is, there is still a real file that is physically stored somewhere, you know, whether it's in like in an in an AWS server or on a blockchain or something, it has a physical representation as a file. So, uh, I don't know, just something to, to not forget. And, and because it has uh, implications when it comes to, to energy usage and to the speed uh, in which you can retrieve the information, right? If it's on, on the other end of the, of the world, on even on, the other, on another planet, you know, it's different if it's physically stored right next to you. That's why we have content uh, CDNs, I think they're called. Mm. And also the people that created TCP IP created a protocol that is thinking precisely about interplanetary communication and, and how long it would take to transmit information and stuff like that. Yeah, to, to your first point, um, definitely. Definitely, most, most cases make sense to store data in something like a file for proximity reasons, and then being able to move this file around in CDNs for efficiency reasons. But one of the things is this concept of the web, which is also a metaphor. It comes from um, the original problem of Berners-Lee at CERN, was drawing connections between different people. And he noticed that they usually drew diagrams with dots and arrows between the dots to say people, project, whatever. And this concept, which is called, uh, I mean, in mathematics, a graph, um, even though we've been doing databases for a few decades, there's only a couple decades of native graph databases out there, which allow you to do this thing precisely. So if you model something like a file as a collection of pointers to lines, and then you store those lines in a relational database, definitely it's going to be like a pain to read one row describing uh, each of the pointers and then go to another table and retrieve the actual content. Why don't you just have a file, right? Of course. But then if you go and look at the native graph databases like Neo4j, which is the one that I use, then 
using their so-called index-free adjacency. You can visit a node, and if the node happens to be the representation of a file, then the pointers or the connections from this node to any other node could be used to represent the different lines of the file and retrieve them in like a comparable time as just reading a file from uh, the file system. And in that case, you don't really have a file. You have a node, and you have connections to other nodes. And then if it, this is a node of type file, you interpret it as, OK, I'm going to load the other nodes connected to it in whatever sorting order uh, specified by the connections, timestamps, whatever. And then you assemble that in the client or even in the server before serving it. But in that case, uh, even though it makes sense um, most of the time to store all the data in a file, you can see that you could simulate files in a graph without having a file system. Well, isn't the graph another file system also? No. No? I would say that the main difference between file and the nodes that we're talking about is the, 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 the minimum size. A file has to be at least four kilobytes, but a node can be how tiny, whatever. It, it's just a concept. It can be mm. whatever. Right. And the file system, that is just a specific implementation. A file system is quite beautiful itself because it just has the read, the list, and the write uh, directives in the C uh, implementation. So it's, I saw someone doing a YouTube file system where if you create a folder, and open up that folder, you will see all the different YouTube videos as .mp4 files that correspond to the search with a folder name. And if you open one of those .mp4 files, it will stream that file from YouTube, uh, just like if it were a file on your local system. So a file system could be virtual. It's just a concept in the same way mm -hmm. that those nodes could be just a concept. But the amazing thing with nodes is they can be however tiny and represent anything. Yeah. Yeah, and the other uh, side of trying to break free from the page or the paper-based pa metaphor and uh, stop thinking about files, which is only one of the paths towards a better web, in my opinion. Not the only one, definitely. But one of the things is that you would have to, you wouldn't have to worry about version control as we worry about now. So Wikipedia is an interesting example again because you still have to manage the page that maps to a file somewhere. But if you do not represent knowledge in terms of pages, but in terms of something more granular, then, for example, going back to the genius.com thing uh, that I didn't recognize at the beginning, but yeah, it was rap genius before, now it's genius.com. And it started as a project for making annotations on rap lyrics, and that then it extended to making annotations and explaining other text. And uh, you can think about like a lyric being this discrete piece of text that exists in human knowledge. And then if you want to make an annotation, you do not really have to edit the file. You, do need, you don't need to uh, get permission to insert your comment on the page. You just create a connection or a reference or a pointer saying, I want to make an annotation. So that, that's one of the advantages that I see. But definitely, I mean, at the end, in, especially if you build it on top of the web, you're going to get a page. So I'm, I'm not saying that we're not going to have pages in the future. I'm just thinking about a different way of using hypertext and all the power that it comes with it to build better pages, let's say, instead of just having this chunk of text in a file that you cannot point to individu individual uh, sections or segments. Sorry, maybe one last question. Um, in terms of these metaphors that aren't, you know, paper, do you, I guess, have you thought about other things uh, other than trails um, as, as an interesting metaphor to sort of take the hypertext to the next level? Well, um... And that's difficult to answer because trails are a subset of 
graphs. And uh, my answer would be graphs, but because they're so related, I don't think that would be enough to answer your question. But yeah, um, a better metaphor is connecting things to each other. So Aslan pointed out some time ago that instead of having a schema in a database or in your interface, you could just build it in the fly by referencing different properties using connections. And then instead of having some document or object with X and Y properties, it will just point to different values using X and Y as labels. And then the interface would understand that this specific object can be placed in a Cartesian uh, plane. I don't think there's probably a better metaphor, but the point is going back to Vinay Prabhupada's description of how the mind works. And this hackathon being around collaboration and creating better tools for thought, if that's how we think, making connections and making associations between pieces of knowledge, then I don't think it would be even a matter of finding a better metaphor for an interface, but a better way to describe how we think. And uh, I haven't found it. Awesome. Thanks for the talk and uh, insightful discussions. Thanks for coming. Matt, do you have any, um, if you're there, you have anything related to telescopic text that you would like to share around this future of text and hypertext stuff? Hey. Um... Is there, like, I guess maybe I'll start, I'll, I'll, I'll send it back to you first, Jorge, like, um, some of the stuff that I've been exploring, how do you think it's related to um, the um, hypertext stuff that you've been discussing today around associations and trails? Do you think there's, like, some interesting um, combination of the two that might be an interesting path forward? And you said path. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah um, definitely. I mean... For those of you who have not played around with telescopic text, this is a concept that I didn't know about before Aslan and Matt showed it. Um, it's just a piece of very short text that you can click on and it will continuously expand into a longer sentence. So if you go to the website for the hackathon, you will find one example for this. And then as you click, you will get more details about the nature of the hackathon. But in general, um, I think that's useful for things like language learning and uh, displaying information in, in computers that have this like space limitation. And uh, one way of modeling those telescopic text uh, interfaces is precisely by making connections between the different versions of the text, the shortest one, the expanded one. And then as you click on different parts of the text, you will be making this different uh, walk around the different versions of the text. I don't know if I would use an interface that is based on telescopic text per se, but you will have to store this pieces of data somewhere. And it's definitely not going to be a page or a file. Of course, in the programming language is going to be one of the native data structures, but once you want to persist it, then you have to choose what's the best representation. And I wouldn't go with a file because are you gonna have a file with, uh, different lines and one line for each version of the sentence? Or are you gonna have a file that is going to be loaded by the programming language and inside the file then you have an array, for example? I don't know, that's one option. But then you still have this notation of the square brackets and whatever commas you need to represent the different elements of the list. And that's not really part of the knowledge you wanna represent. So still I would ask what's the next level so that I can just keep the individual pieces of text without any specific format around it. Yeah, um, in regards to like authoring for a telescopic text, it's interesting, it's, it's not very intuitive yet. It's um, quite difficult to like create these things. So like the one that like people might have seen on like the interhack.space site, um, I, I like basically coded the like um, kind of like the expansions directly into the HTML and that's just not like, um, 
that's not really feasible if it's going to become like a new authoring platform in the future. Um, uh, another kind of aspect that I was thinking about is like um, some of the things that you were talking about today, Jorge, it, does, it definitely feels like you could kind of layer on this like telescopic aspect um, quite easily without like kind of um, altering any of the vision. It kind of just like augments it and improves it, um, which is kind of interesting. Um, but yeah. Definitely. Yeah, in the in the larger topic of, of interfaces, if anyone wants to talk about that, um, how do you guys see the web or in general computers improving? Because right now, even though we don't notice all the limitations, we're still like struggling with centering stuff with CSS or um, trying to find the best layout for a website. And I think that those are just details that should be configurable. And uh, this goes back to some of the topics discussed during the week, which is composable interfaces. So composable is about nesting, but configurable is also important in terms of uh, giving us freedom to modify interfaces, maybe in a workflow, so that we can improve our knowledge work. So right now you have to download whatever app is out there. And if you don't like it enough, then you go and download another one. And maybe you have a combination of separate apps that are not really integrated into a workspace. And then you have to switch between them so that um, you can com complete your work. Fortunately, we have this like clipboard, uh, that's the name. Uh, yeah, when you copy paste, you have this operating system uh, storage to keep that sentence or picture or whatever you copy. And that's how we have forgotten that we're using different interfaces, different apps that do not belong to the same workspace, even though they're on the same computer. But uh, I don't know if anyone has comments on the future of interfaces as a sequence of configurable uh, screens that you can adapt to your own use case. I think the problem is uh, the language uh the way for example the web is coded today you're coding a representation you know instead of annotating the data and saying this is like uh i don't know the the author of the article this is like the introduction etc you are coding like this part will look like bold in the end this size etc right and there have been, I don't know, for the last 10 or even longer years, uh, the idea of the semantic web, right? But it hasn't worked so far. And it's totally related to that because once you have like a piece of information that is self describing itself, then any kind of software could represent it in, in different ways according to the context, whether it is. Uh, something visual on a screen or it's sound for example or any other representation of the same ideas but right now we are just coding a visual representation into it and i think that hopefully that will change yeah totally um one of the you mentioned languages that's interesting because one of the things that are probably going to change in the next few years, not coincidentally related to Rome research using Clojure, which is a Lisp language, uh, mm -hmm. is that we're going to start to blur the line between code and data. So Lisp yeah. languages have this philosophy of code as data, data as code, because it uses internal data structures to represent the source code. So you can go back and forth using different evaluation mechanisms. And if you go that way, then you can make configurable interfaces very easily. I don't know how far you have to take that notion. Um, and if you could do it, I mean, borrow some of the learnings of object-oriented programming in the Allen K sense, not in the C++ yeah. class and Java sense, even if you're just using uh, functional programming constructs, because you also have encapsulation uh, using closures, right? So I don't know if that's the way you were thinking about it, but definitely that's the way I, I hope it evolves.
Yeah, absolutely. I've been working a little bit uh, towards a new hmm. kind of editor. Uh, and while going through the, down that path, I realized that it won't work if I don't separate it more and more and more and more. And I'm getting further and further and further away from the implementation details. So uh, I'm seeing it as the only way to do it is making a language that is going back to the root of hypertext and making it fully declarative. In the beginning, hypertext was fully declarative. You said, this is the title, this is, and then the web browser took care of everything. But now, not so much. Uh, but uh, yeah, so uh, one discovery that I thought was quite cool uh, is that a language, the language doesn't just have to be English, but a user interface is also could also be seen as a language. Yes. And if you see a user interface as a language and the text as a language, then you could add the different things, the different kind of interactions uh, you can generalize over that. So for instance, if you have an outliner, that is just a language and the outliner could nest other kind of languages, for instance, English text. And the English text could also list, uh, nest uh, other kind of languages, for instance, uh, some Latesh similar kind of math visual representation. Mm. But then the editor needs to be able to render everything in a nonlinear fashion. But if you, you, you're able to do that much more declaratively, then you can, oh, you only have to implement the ability to select things once and everything are nodes and everything are connected together and you're suddenly able to create a bunch of different things. Funny, I was thinking about our conversation yeah. also yes, yesterday or the day before, Leonard, about your declarative languages. <laughs> yeah, I'd love to hear more about that if, if you want to share. Uh, definitely, I'm on the side of innovation um, will come from language design and interfaces, both graphical and APIs as a form of language is what are going to help us uh, improve our technologies. So if uh, I, came, I came with this, uh, a similar insight this year by studying this languages and in, in particular, this book by Paul Graham called On Lisp, because I thought the title was just on the topic of Lisp. Like many books are just like on the physical representation or on the meditations of whatever, right? Like classical books, most of all. And uh, then I noticed by reading the book uh, that it was not really about like on the topic of Lisp, but building on top of Lisp. So the philosophy is called like bottom up programming which means nothing to me still, but it is about building languages on top of existing languages. So yeah, I, I would really uh, like to hear more about that, uh, Leonard, if you want to share now or later. Sure, it's, uh, it's quite, every time I try to do anything in this project, I realize that there are so, the, the hole goes so much deeper and there are so much more things to uncover. Uh, so yeah. I have quite hard times to formulate a project in one sentence more than taking all of software and taking it through a blender and then getting some sort of homogeneous mix out of it uh, and making a new kind of medium for it where all kind of interactions uh, and all kind of software and all kind of data and knowledge, there are no boundaries really between it. Everything is just one homogeneous mix. Uh, so. Um, but uh, about what you're describing about on list, uh, is that, uh, do, do, do I understand it correctly as domain specific languages that they are yes. related to? So that I also see as a really key part of it. And also when you're doing knowledge representation uh, and concept representation, uh, if you have the ability to um, describe how different things relate to other things and make aliases, etc., uh, then you get uh, quite po powerful interfaces. So you can get the power from Haskell of being very, very abstract in general, but you can also get the power of doing something very, very uh, domain specific. Uh, so I see that as really a key part to be able to make domain specific languages that are not just text-based, but also domain specific in the kind of interfaces that you interact with, the visual way or the sound that you interact with or any kind of things like that. And then also to be able to have the best interface uh, for the specific task that you're doing, uh, even though you might be doing multiple different tasks on the same kind of data, 
So you have the data as one sort of truth, and then you have multiple different mappers to different representations, and those representations can have different sort of interfaces that can both read and write. So for instance, if you're trying to do some 3D thing, you might want to edit it in VR, but you might want to see it on the computer screen, or you might want, want to edit it as a clay cube, I don't know, that was not the best example, but uh, if you're able to go between different domain-specific languages for the same kind of data, uh, something extremely powerful is getting unlocked. I think there should be a difference made between um, programming languages and what I like to call notation, you know? A notation mm -hmm. for, which would be more le like a, an alphabet. An alphabet is a notation, but we use the same alphabet for many different languages, right? Or like musical notation. And I think the most close thing we have now is probably uh, uh, Markdown, for example. Okay. Which is just a way to notate a text and it has meaning, right? And it's easy to understand for everyone, but it's not a programming language by itself it's just uh yeah it's just describing what the information means in a declarative way yeah i, I love that analogy because there's this project out there called mdx which allegedly uh wants to help you combine markdown files with um react components mm -hmm. so maybe that would be a way to to have text and programs sitting next to each other I don't know if you've seen it, but yeah. No, I'll look for it. I'm working on something that is sort of like Markdown, but for for subtitles. Nice. To annotate videos. So it's called MDX. MDX, uh, yeah, JS should, should be, or? Yeah, that's what yeah, Just it. type M MDX and I think it be the. Yeah, it's MDX JS. Yeah. Cool. I want to uh, experiment with something similar, but instead of JSX, which is a domain-specific language, I want to use Hiccup, um, which is the DSL of React interfaces, actually. Um, whatever, it's using Clojure. And uh, in that way, it would be similar. You would have like markdown and lines of text, and then you could have a Hiccup description of a React component, and then combine the two of them. It's really interesting that um, you both, um, Juan and Leonard, talk about DSLs and uh, the intersection between them and user interfaces, if you understand interfaces as languages, because the, the notation that you mentioned, Juan, I think we, still ha uh, we already have it. So one of the things people say about Lisp languages is that they figured out this notation and in mathematics, for example, uh, some people say that mathematics is invented. Some other people say that it's discovered. I'm on the latter side. I believe it's discovered. And we happen to use a notation system uh, to express those discoveries. One of the examples is calculus. And then even though we mostly recognize Newton as the inventor, at the same time, Leibniz was independently discovering uh, calculus, but using a different notation. So even though we recognize or mostly say Newton made it first and he won the battle with the Royal Society, I mean, um, providing support, we are using Leibniz notation instead of Newton's. So I really like your comment on finding notation because that's what happens with Lisp languages. So they found this, um, looks a bit difficult to read with all the parentheses and stuff, but when you come down to the original description of the language, and seven forms and two special forms, I think. I don't remember well. Um, it feels like that. Like they discovered, not, not invented. People say John McCarthy discovered Lisp instead of inventing some other language. And that's the way I perceive it. It's a, a universal, not really, but it's a notation for representing different languages. And that's why, as far as I know, the only language that speaks of its descendants as dialects is Lisp. You have Racket, you have Clojure, you have mm -hmm. Common Lisp and all that stuff. And they said they're dialects because the notation is exactly the same, even though in Clojure you have like square brackets for data structures. 
but still, this, the notion of a list and things being applied to and all that stuff follow the same notation. And that's why Alan K. Um, yeah, and the prefix also. Yeah, the prefix notation, yes. And that's what, why Alan K. said that Lisp gave us the Maxwell equations of programming, something like that. <laughs> So yeah, yeah, I really like your comment on notation. I think that's a lot, a lot of work to do there. And on Leonard's uh, comment of DSLs, um, that's what you can build on top of Lisp. If you choose this specific notation, then you stop worrying about syntax. And then you go and try to discover the best functions and data structures with a specific domain so that you can express things better. Aslan also uh, mentioned something about wanting to build an user interface that is not graphical, something like that. So what type of language would you need to interact, for example, with audio, right, without having an interface? So how would you go about that? How would you communicate with the computer without having this shortcut that Leonard pointed out of the graphical user interface to click and translate that action to a specific function call that then runs the program. If you don't have that, how do you interact with it, right? And then you're talking about like human um, computer interaction at, the, at a natural language processing level instead of a point and click metaphor level. Yes. Say, hey, Alexa. <laughs> I want this. <laughs> yeah, something like that, something like that. Yeah. It, it's, it's funny in, on this topic of languages that uh, I mentioned this yesterday. Brendan Eich, the creator of JavaScript, which has been trashed all this time because of all the drawbacks of the language, he was originally hired to do Scheme in the browser. So he was supposed to bring Lisp to the web. And then when he got hired, I was like, no, 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 we're not going to do that. Uh, we need something more Java or C-like. And then he had to use that syntax instead of the notation discovered by Lisp. And now, 25 years later, uh, we're going back to this closure script world and way of doing things. Of course, compiling down to JavaScript. But still, I mean, it makes me think that, OK, maybe we are 25 years uh, late to this possible alternate future of uses, using Scheme in the browser, but maybe that's how we will end up. So we'll see. Well, you, you could create a, like a, a new browser that understands a different notation, right? Yeah, definitely. I guess uh, someone can, could come up with a browser with a native closure script engine. I don't know. For now, we have to compile it down to JavaScript, which I don't think is that bad. But um, I think that's yeah. what I think Google wanted to do that with Dart, but they get a lot yeah. of pushback. Yeah, yeah, that's 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 more difficult to accomplish. I, I don't think there's a, a there's a short way of replacing that. Pretty much in the same way that uh, you wouldn't find it easy to say, "Hey, I built this new hypertext system that is better than the web." Um, publish your applications using this uh, format and protocol or whatever. And then adoption is key there. So you better go and build on top of the web. And in the browser, well, maybe someday we will have support for other languages. But for now, we can just build on top of the existing. I guess through WebAssembly, it will come eventually also. Yeah, and I, I saw something related to that topic that I think it would be possible to make it use Lisp notation. But yeah, I, I didn't see any more updates on that. In, in any case, I, I don't think we will be writing uh, web apps in WebAssembly. If someone comes up with a compiler that lets you use whatever language you want, and then it just transforms the code before deploying. Yes. I'm currently okay. using Rust compiled to WebAssembly in my projects. Oh, really? Nice. The only thing it's missing that I'm waiting for is a web GPU that allows you to access the GPU directly and not having to go, go through JavaScript. And also additional additions to the web browser that allows you to access the DOM and the web browser APIs directly without having to go through JavaScript, because currently you need bridges. 
So that means eventually you will be able to write your websites with Rust, Leonard? Uh, yeah, the people do it already because they have bridges that make it automatically. Uh, Vast BindGen and SDD Web, etc., uh, which are quite cool. So you can, it's almost like you can just write Java, uh, all the old JavaScript functions that are usually accessible in the browser are accessible uh, through Rust. Uh, and then they make the bindings automatically in the uh, background. Excellent. I, I think Figma is uh, made uh, using something similar, or C++ with Wasp to get the, the performance. Nice. Uh, Leonard, I forgot to ask what you meant by a domain-specific language for hypertext. I have not thought about that, but it sounds like I should. So I'm really uh, interested if you have any more thoughts on that. What what does a DSL for hypertext look like? Sure, if I said DSL uh, this, uh, for hypertext specifically, but what I meant is domain specific language for any kind of thing that you're trying to make, and then having it convert to a common ground that can then be exported to any kind of. Uh, computational substrate or presentational substrate that you can see the web, uh, browser as. Uh, so it won't matter really. So you can just edit in the most convenient way and you can read it in any kind of format and way. So it won't matter. The, the, the medium won't matter anymore. You move past it. Nice. In another so, topic. Say again? Uh, uh, one, one of my milestones will be uh, to be able to open up something and write app, click a button, or not even that, and then have an application that is running on the watch, on the, the iPhone, on Android, basically everywhere, uh, with the same kind of functionality without having to do anything. Yeah, so this, this comes back to your notion of having to abstract away more and more from the details, I guess. Hmm. Another topic you mentioned was uh, having multiple views on the same data, which is something that uh, we have discussed um, during and before this hackathon. And uh, you could think of a page as one of those views. But if you want to really be able to have multiple representations of a page, like multiple layouts and whatever, multiple views on the same data, then you have to detach it somehow. So I, I'm not, I don't want to go back to the file versus uh, other format conversation necessarily, but yeah, you make me think of uh, how do you really enable this type of uh, interfaces, like having that's multiple another, users in data without detaching them. That, that's another of the core insights, uh, I believe, is that all of the nodes should not be should not have any specific parent. That all every node are they all are their own entity. And then they can be inside any kind of other nodes, and they can have any kind of nodes, including themselves, in themselves. Uh, so you, you don't have a main page that has a main content, and then you embed that page, or you link to a part of that page. But instead, you have any kind of node, and you can take and mesh up any kind of nodes. But then you can also embed tra uh, trails, if I <laughs> use your terminology. Uh, to, or uh, that includes the context of how you arrived at that specific node. Uh, and then, then you will get the, the uh, persistence in that sort of way. Yeah, I think that's the key. Uh, I guess you could call it standalone data or something like that. But definitely, if you want to be able to point at something, then it needs to be an entity on its own. I think that's one of the concepts on this article that I mentioned, really recommended um, this one. I'm not sharing my browser now, but you guys, um, maybe I can copy it later. And uh, yeah, I'm going to share it on, on the links chat. Where is it? Where is it? Here. And, and this article even says something about like servers and clients and uh, is against having embedded markdown, embedded markup. So even like, having the notation for the hierarchy in a document will be apart from the data itself.
avsnitt. Anyone uh, has more questions or ideas, or should we call it a day? Okay, guys. The biggest, huh? but the, the, the biggest issue I currently having is uh, the amount of time it takes to revamp the whole stack. To what? Revamp the whole stack to re implement text editing, it re implement compilers, re implement networking. Uh, it's more work than I suspected from the start. It is just mm. going on and on and on. Maybe, maybe. I, I don't think that's, that's the only option. Maybe that's what I meant by uh, building on top of the existing web. So the point of this trail of slides and picking those quotes from different books going over the history of hypertext is precisely to like, have a resource that helps you remember what, haven't been, what hasn't been implemented yet. So, I mean, what we have with the web and browsers right now is amazing. You have one platform, and even though you have to do some compatibility checks, you pretty much can assume that everyone's going to check, um, like see your website in a similar way. Now the thing is, what are you going to build on top of it? So also 25 years ago, uh, Paul Graham's startup, BioWeb, had a store builder for e-commerce sites. And that company ended up being acquired by Yahoo and became Yahoo Stores. And they created this language called RTML instead of HTML. And of course, the purpose of the language was to compile or generate HTML at the end, but it was a different set of like, primitives and functions to let people build stores uh, programmatically with an interface, I think drag and drop and stuff. And they could ultimately edit the code. But I mentioned it because, I mean, not only was a language on top of HTML 25 years ago, uh, of course, it was also a Lisp being a uh, program startup. And uh, the documentation is live still. Some, somewhere out there in the Yahoo store documentation, you can still find this RTML specification. And uh, you would think that, I mean, being 25 years, someone else would have done that again. And especially now, of course, no one's going to go and like, try to implement modern web applications with common list or something. That would be really difficult, but something like Clojure and ClojureScript are way more friendly um, and tied to the same code as data philosophy and uh, with more support for libraries and stuff. You can even use NPM packages from ClojureScript, so that, that wouldn't be a limitation either. But still goes back to the thing of, uh, OK, what's the right language? Is it RTML? Maybe not. What is it then? And then if people realize this uh, insight that you have, Leonard, that maybe what we have to invent is languages instead of just applications, and then with different layers of languages, we can build better applications at the end, then you would have people just, OK, I'm not really building an app. I'm building this language for people to build apps of this specific domain. And then you would see a proliferation of like better components and better interfaces that are modular and composable because they're based on languages that can be translated between them or just uh, interoperate because they're like Latin languages or something. I don't know. Yeah, I think one of the core ideas is uh, not inventing more languages, not, inven not adding another standard, but being able to add a new kind of protocol or system of doing things that allows you to, the, the, that removes the notion of having a specific language. It doesn't matter what kind of language you use. You can use any kind of any language and have it work anyhow to get rid of everything. So you remove the restriction of having one kind of standard. And that is the way I think is the only way to make it actually scale. Gotcha. OK. 
Okay, guys, this I think uh, this is the end of the session. Um, definitely open to having more conversations around these or other topics. And thank you all for coming.